Question one, we've got 3.7 add 5.7. If we do three add five, the whole numbers first, then we get eight. And then if we add what's after the decimal point, that's 0 0.7 add 0 0.7, which makes 1.4. So we're adding 1.4 onto eight, and that equals to 9.4. Question two, we've got 15.2 take away 5.7. So we can think of it as take away the 0 0.7 from 15.2. If we are to take away just 0 0.2, we end up at 15. And then we need to take away a further 5.5. It's the same really as saying 15 take away 5.5. So 15 take away 5 would have been 10. But 15 take away 5.5 is going to be 0 0.5 less than that. So it's going to be 9.5. Next, we've got 254 times six. So four times six is 24. So we've got four extra two. Five times six is 30. Add the two is 32. So we've got two extra three. Two times six is 12. Add the three is 15. So we've got one, five, two, four. Then for question four, 342 divided by six. How many six is going to 34? Well, six times five is 30. And we've got left over four, six times seven is 42. So the answer is 57. Question five, we are told that Q is the midpoint of the line MN. The line MN is the line that goes from the point M to the point N. So this line has the midpoint, so the halfway point of Q and the coordinates of Q are 30 for the x coordinate and 50 for the y coordinate. So we are asked to find the coordinates of points m and n. So for q, the x coordinate is 30. That means on the horizontal axis, this is 30. This is halfway between 0, 0, the origin, and the point n, meaning that 30 is the halfway point of what would be here, 60. And meanwhile, on the y-axis, the y-coordinate of q is said to be 50. So if this is 50, and again, it's halfway up, then m must be double 50, m must be 100. So if we look at the coordinate of m, first of all, that's 0 across and 100 up. So 0 for the x-coordinate and 100 for the y-coordinate. Meanwhile, it also asks us about n, so n's x-coordinate is 60, and n's y-coordinate is 0, because it hasn't gone off the x-axis at all. Question 6. On each spinner, write five numbers to make the statements correct. It is certain that you will get a number less than 6. If it is certain, that means 100% chance that you will get a number less than six, meaning that all of the numbers you have here have to be less than six. So I could just say one, two, three, four, five, and all of them are less than six. It doesn't matter what I pick, the number will be less than six. With the next spinner, it says it is more likely that you will get an even number than an odd number. Well, we've got five different options here. Each have a probability of one fifth, which means if we have a higher probability of having an even number than an odd number, then that higher probability means the probability of an even number needs to be more than half. So in other words, it could be three out of five or even, or four out of five or even, or even all of them are even. So we can't have any fewer than three of them being even, because if two of them are even, then most of them are going to be odd and that defeats the point. So I'm just going to put in one odd number and I'll put in the rest as even. So two, four, six, eight. There are lots of different possibilities you can have here, as you can probably imagine. For the next one, it is impossible that you will get a multiple of three. Multiples of three, meaning numbers in the three times table. So any number I have here cannot appear in the three times table. So I could have one, I could have two, I could have four, five, seven. So I just missed out the numbers in the three times table, namely three and six. But you could choose much bigger numbers, like for example, 22. As long as you know that it's not in the three times table, this should be okay, because now it is impossible that you will get a multiple of three.
A meal in a restaurant costs the same for each person. For 11 people, the total cost is £253. What is the total cost for 12 people? Well, first, we need to divide this total cost of 253 by 11. Then we know what the cost is per person. So how many times does 11 go into 25? Well, it goes twice because 11 times 2 is 22. We've got leftover 3. And 11 times 3 makes 33, which means per person, you've got 23 pounds. Or per head, we also like to call this. Meaning if we've got 12 people, then there's two ways we could do this. Either we could do 12 times 23, which is the long way. Or since we've already got the total for 11 people, we can just add 23 pounds, so this one extra person, onto the existing total cost for 11 people, which is 253. So 253 add 23 is 276. And don't forget the pound sign because it has not been provided in this case. Question eight, we are comparing the year 1976 to the year 2002. The information in the box says in 1976, a man earned £16 pounds each week. The pie chart shows how he spent his money. So this pie chart represents the total of the 16 pounds that he earned. And we can see that the pie chart is split into fractions. So if we know what proportion of the full circle each portion is, that will help us to find out how much money he's actually spending. Part A asks us, how much did the man spend on food each week? Well, food, here, this is a 90 degree angle, or we can tell that with these markings, this would be equivalent of a quarter. If we're going clockwise from the top, this would be halfway. It's kind of like a clock. So food is two eighths or a quarter of the whole thing. If food represents a quarter and the whole thing is out of 16 pounds, then we're doing one quarter of 16, which is four pounds a week spent on food. Part B is related to part A. It says, now look at this information. In 2002, a man earned 400 pounds each week. The table shows how he spent his money. So 200 pounds was spent on rent, 100 on food, 50 on entertainment, and 50 was categorized as other expenses. All of these you'll notice adds up to the 400, which is the total amount of money that he spent. Now it says complete the pie chart below to show how the man spent his money. Remember to label each sector of the pie chart. So now we're given an empty pie chart and it's up to us how we label this. So for our ease, let's convert these into fractions of the pie chart. Well, rent makes up 200 out of 400 of the pounds. In other words, rent accounts for half of the pie chart. Food is 100 out of 400 or a quarter of the pie chart. Entertainment is 50. Well, if food was 100 and food was a quarter, then entertainment is 50, which is half of 100. That means it needs to be two times as small as a quarter. So entertainment being 50 is one eighth of the total. Similarly, other, which is 50 pounds, is also going to be one eighth of the total because 50 times eight makes that 400. So I'm going to go ahead and split the pie chart according to these proportions. Half is rent, a quarter is food, and then we've got the remaining quarter split further into two parts, one eighth and one eighth. Rent is half, so first I'm going to split this circle in half. Food was a quarter, so I need to split one of the halves into half again. And then entertainment and other were each one eighth, which are each half of a quarter again. So it's going to look something like that. Now we just need to label them. Question nine, calculate minus 12 minus five. 
Well, if we've already got minus 12, we're already in the negative side of the numbers. Every number that we're taking away, we're going more and more negative. So for example, minus 12 minus one would be minus 13. So actually we can think of it as 12 out of five makes 17 in the same way if we start off with minus 12 and we go a further five back, we've ended up now at minus 17. The next question is six take away 18. If it was six take away six, then it would be zero. We've got a further 12 to take away. So therefore this must be minus 12. Minus two add nine. Well, if it was minus two add two, we would get zero, but we've got a further seven to add. Therefore, this is positive seven. We don't really need to write the plus sign. Question 12, I have a square piece of paper. The diagram shows information about this square labeled A. I fold square A in half to make rectangle B. And square A, according to these dimensions, is eight centimeters by eight centimeters. What is the perimeter of shape B? Or of rectangle B. Well, if we've halved the square, then that means that one of the dimensions of the square remains the same. So this is still eight, but this has halved. So instead of eight, this is going to be eight divided by two, which is four. Then of course, we need to be careful to see, are we doing area or perimeter? We are doing perimeter. So perimeter means the distance all the way around the shape. Therefore, we're doing eight add four, add eight add four, or we could just do eight add four is 12 times two is 24. Units they have not provided, so we need to do that. In this case, it's perimeter, which means the units will be in centimeters. On to the next part, then I fold rectangle B in half to make square C. So that means this is remaining the same. This is still four, but what used to be eight across here is now being halved. So this eight turns into a four. And to find the perimeter of this, it's just four add four add four add four, or four times four, which is 16. This is a square number. Of course, the units again will be in centimeters. Question 13, calculate 15% of 340. Now 15% means 15 out of 100. 15 out of 100. And of in maths means multiply. So we need to multiply this by 340, which is the same as 340 over one. So we are finding 15 out of 100 multiplied by 340. Well, we need to simplify this. We need to cancel the top and bottom by common factors. We can see that in the denominator here, we've got a zero, which means we can divide by 10 on the bottom. We can divide by 10 on the top. What else can we divide by? Well, 15 and 10 have a common factor of five. So I could divide the top by five here and get three. I could divide the bottom by five here and get two. But we've actually got one more step we can do, which is that two and 34, remember we always need to go to the opposite floors. We can't do across the denominators or across the numerators. Cancellation or simplification of fractions always has to be numerator and denominator. So two and 34, well, they can both be divided by two because they're both even. So two divided by two leaves us with one and 34 divided by two is 17. So now all we've got is three times 70 and 17 times three is 51. Before we move on though, we want to think, does this answer sound believable? And it does because 51 is not very much of 340. If we made a mistake and said 510 or something, we'd be able to tell that it's a mistake because it can't be more than the existing number. It's always good to think in maths, is my answer believable or not? 14, calculate five eighths of $160. This is very similar to the previous question because we've got a fraction of an amount. So it's multiplication again. And so we need to find common factors between the numerators and the denominators. Well, five and eight don't really have any common factors, but eight and 160 have common factors of eight. In fact, you can divide both by eight. So eight divided by eight is one. 160 divided by eight is 20, because if we had 16 divided by eight, that would be two. 160 is 10 times as big as 16 is. So 160 divided by eight is 20. Now we've got 20 times 5, which is 100. 
here, though, we need to be careful with units because here in Britain, we are very used to writing the pound sign. But in this case, the question says dollars. So we need to do the same unit that the question has mentioned. Again, before moving on, we want to think, is this believable or not? Well, it is because if we had four eighths of 160, that would have been half. Half of 160 is $80. This is a little bit more than $80. So it's five eighths, which is more than four eighths. Seems to be adding up. 15A, you can rotate triangle A onto triangle B. Put a cross on the center of rotation. So triangle A is this bottom one here. Triangle B is the top one here. So it would have to rotate 90 degrees anti-clockwise in order for A to turn into B. But when it's saying the center of rotation, what it means is imagine you've got a clock and the hands of the clock are turning around. There's a point around which they're turning, which is the center of rotation. Same thing is happening here. Imagine A is like a triangular hand of a clock. What's the center point that everything is rotating around? It's this point here. This is like the hinge that it turns on. Question B says that we can rotate triangle A onto triangle B. The rotation is anti-clockwise as we identified. What is the angle of rotation? We said here that this was 90 degrees. In other words, it has turned a quarter of the way. So the triangle used to be facing south, if you like. And now that it's rotated 90 degrees anti-clockwise, now the triangle is pointing east, if you like. So it's traveled through a 90 degree angle. Question C is asking us to reflect triangle A in the mirror line. It says we can use tracing paper to help us, but tracing paper can be a bit time consuming. It can help us, but I'll show you a way that we can do it without. So whenever you've got a mirror line, also known as a line of symmetry, I'd advise you to rotate your head so that you see that line either vertically or horizontally. Alternatively, you could just rotate the paper so that it looks like this dashed line is standing up. For now, we can think about turning our head 45 degrees clockwise. Now imagine a line coming out perpendicular to the mirror line, coming out at 90 degrees to the mirror line and joining each of the points that you've got. These are the three points of your triangle. Now, when you're reflecting the triangle, that triangle also needs to have three points. One of those points is actually being shared, as you can see here, because this is on the mirror line itself. So the two new points that we're going to have on this side of the mirror line are going to be the reflection of this point and the reflection of this point. So the tactic is to imagine a perpendicular line going from this dot to the mirror line. And how many squares did we go across? We went across one square and a half. So we're going to go one and a half the other way, which takes us to this point. Now let's come all the way down here and do the same thing. Let's go at a 90 degree angle from here and see how many squares away are we from this mirror line. So one square, two squares and a half. That means we need to go two and a half along the same line in the opposite direction. So that's half gone, one and a half, two and a half. Now that we've got these three points, all we need to do is join these up, which you will be doing with a ruler. Like so. 17, a bag of sweets contains 420 sweets. If these are to be shared equally between 17 people, how many sweets would each person get? 17 people in the question, 17 as well. So 420 sweets that we are sharing between 17 people. How many times does 17 go into four? Well, it doesn't. So technically we can put a zero there. And then how many times does 17 go into 42? Well, 17 times two is 34. And that seems like the closest that we can get because double 17 is 34. So 17 times two is 34. How much do we have left over? Eight we have left over. 
Well, we already said that 17 times 2 is 34. If we double that again, then we're going to get 17 times 4, which is 68. That leaves us with 12 to go, not enough to fit in a further 17, which means 4 over here. And of course, remainder 12, although the question didn't ask for this bit. So how many sweets does each person get? Each person gets 24. I would also say sweets as the unit to be safe. There are 12 left over, but you don't have enough for each person to have one more. Put these numbers in order of size from smallest to largest, that should say of size. So these have varying numbers of digits, but what matters is the place value, i.e. the digit that comes just after the decimal point. What is that in each case? Here it's two, here it's one. So this is smaller. If we compare the second number to the third number, the digit just after the decimal in the second one is one, and the third one here it's zero. So actually the third one so far is the smallest. Let's see if any others have a zero in the tenths column. This one does, this one doesn't, and this one does. So now we're comparing this one, this one, and this one to see the hundredths column. Here we've got two, five, and six. Well, that's actually in order. So we can say that this is the smallest. This is one. This is first. This is second. This is third. Now we're moving on to the bigger ones. We can clearly see that 0 0.2 is the biggest because in the tenths column it has a 2, whereas in the tenths column the other remaining options only have a 1. So with these two that we're comparing, we then need to go on to the hundredths column. Here in the hundredths column we've got 2 versus here in the hundredths column we've got 0, so this must be next. This is then fourth. This is of course fifth because it was just afterwards, and this is Sixth. It's really important in these questions to see if they're asking smallest to largest or largest to smallest. If it was largest to smallest, we would have to write these numbers in the complete opposite order. So that is something to be very careful about. But of course, we haven't finished the question. We need to then write those numbers in the correct order. So first of all, we've got 0 0.02. Then the second one was 0 0.0546. The third one was 0 0.065. Let's put commas in between to make it clearer. The fourth one was 0 0.102. The fifth one is 0 0.122. We're slightly running out of space, but the sixth one would be 0 0.2. And that's it for today's paper. So if there are any other papers that you would like me to cover, please do let me know in the comments down below. I will try my best to cover them and I shall see you next time.